Okay, thanks everyone. Welcome to the third and final session of the day. Uh, we've run over time, but I think that's okay. We'll make the most of this last session and uh, have an extended Q&A at the end since we couldn't have one just now. So in this uh, third session, we're gonna, which is, looks quite lonely up here, just me and Ellie, but we've got some friends online. Uh, so we're gonna be asking, where do we go from here? What are the policy tools, the means of gov governance, and the professional configurations that can help bridge the gap between how we currently treat stone and other materials um, and how we can use them in a more circular or in enduring way. Basically, how do we make what we all want to happen actually happen? Is it about providing models for scaling up reuse so it becomes an economically viable practice? and a practice that may actually one day have an impact on the demand for an extraction of new materials? Is it about incentivizing reuse through things like subsidies and tax breaks, through enabling cheaper rents for organizations specializing in reuse? Is it about imposing new guidelines and laws like higher thresholds for the approval of demolition? For example, if a structural survey reveals that a building could easily stand for another only 20 years, maybe demolition should be forbidden. As about establishing lower thresholds or more realistic thresholds for the certification of reused building materials for insurance and liability purposes. And ultimately, how can we change the psychology of the construction industry, its first reflexes, and I'm including architecture in that. For instance, if you were going to buy a new car today, most likely you'd uh, check out the feasibility of an electric vehicle first. So surely in architecture and construction, the similar reflex should be uh, reuse materials first. That feels like that should be a, a given now or very soon. Or at the very least, um, could we establish a process of due diligence where the feasibility of employing used materials has to be studied and proven as a first step? So these are the kinds of speculations that the presenters and respondents can flesh out and help make real, either through visionary projects or through concrete policy. So to introduce our presenters this afternoon, uh, Michael Gute has already presented this morning, but I'll just recap. He's been with Rotor for 14 years. He has a PhD in architecture, and uh, one of his main tasks now is the development of the FCRBE project, which stands for Facilitating the Circulation of Reused Building Elements. It's an EU project based in Northwest Europe with 11 protagonists, and uh, Rotor is one of the leaders. The aim is to develop guidance documents, uh, the documentation of the existing reclamation industry, and communicating the whole reuse effort, how to frame it. Michael also co-wrote and edited the book, Deconstruction Air Reemploy, published in 2018. Ellie Moon is a Malaysian architectural designer and occasional filmmaker based in London. During his final year at the AA, he proposed a strategic reorganization of building resources at a regional scale, making salvage and reuse practices more viable for demolition contractors, architects, and building owners. After graduation, he worked on the documentary Placeholders as part of the VNA project, um, led by Juliet and Odeline, as part of the London Design Festival. And he's now an architectural assistant at David Chipperfield. And the respondents this afternoon, Gaetan Daniels, is the representative of the Secretary of State of the Brussels Capital Region, Barbara Tract. And she's responsible in turn for economic transition and scientific research. Uh, obviously, part of economic transition is circularizing the economy. Anne's Poissons, uh, unfortunately, is not going to be able to join us due to a family situation, though she's expressed her great enthusiasm for what we're talking about here and a deep disappointment that she can't join us. It's a real pity as she's a deputy mayor of Brussels um, in charge of urban planning and public space, and she has therefore has her hands on the lever of uh, what gets demolished and what gets saved. Uh, hopefully we can still discuss her innovation, uh, which she helped to pioneer, which is a carbon calculator tool to try to objectify, objectivize and broadcast the real impact of demolition, both in terms of carbon and its collateral damage on the, the urban fabric and standard of living. So Michael, if you're there online, are you ready to join us? And, and would you like to start? 
Yes, there I am. Just allow me one one second to share my screen. Yes, it should be on. Can you confirm? Yeah. Yeah, great. So I go on. Um, so I got out of my library of old books and old architects from the second half of the 20th century to present you a, a project which is still going on. Actually, the first phase just finished like one week ago, uh, but we are now in the extension, extension, sorry extension phase uh, through the capitalization uh, extension. But what I'm going to talk about now is the results of the, this three-year uh, period uh, that just finished. So as James said, the, the project is entitled FCRBE. It's a complicated acronym, but at least when you get it right, there is only one result when you type it in Google. So uh, and, and, and when you explain it, it becomes slightly more explicit. It stands for facilitating the circulation of reclaimed building elements in Northwest Europe. That's the scope of the, of the program uh, that funds it or that co-funds it because there, are, there is a lot of match funding uh, equally involved in, in this project. Um, it's project which initial phase was uh, carried out by eight partners. Uh, at Rota, we were leading this consortium, but we also uh, enjoyed the presence of many different types of actors. There are people engaged and involved in the field of reuse, such as Salvo and, and Bellastock um, from the UK and France, respectively. We had public authorities with the presence of Brussels environment, uh, scientific and technical expertise with the presence of the BBRI and the CSTB, uh, Belgium and France respectively, and then the University of Brighton for say the academic side. And I forgot the Construction Confederation, which is a, a patronal organization for the construction industry in, in, in Belgium. So quite a, uh, a mixed uh, partnership. The project in itself was split into three main work packages, implementation work packages with three different uh, sub-objectives, all of them converging to the general objective, which is increasing the amount of materials being reclaimed and reused uh, in Northwest Europe. And so the first work packages was about enhancing the visibility and the representation of the reuse sector. So the existing reclamation and salvage trade, uh, a, a, a very big output of that is, is documentation of all or most of the existing uh, companies active in this field for continental Europe, but for um, the UK and Ireland as well. Uh, the results of these research are uh, published on salvoweb.com and Opalis, which are online um, directories of dealers which you can find more information about what exactly are the type of materials that you can find, the type of services that are provided and that sort of, of, of things. Uh, just to give you a very short glimpse uh, and I selected here a, a few dealers specialized in uh, dealing uh, reclaimed stones. Uh, for instance, Materio Noble Gazu Effis uh, in Eure et Loire in France. Uh, this is another one. We already saw it in uh, Lionel's presentation in the last session, Maris Naturstein, uh, not too far from Brussels. In this case, it's mostly for sets and cobblestones. Uh, another one, slightly more southern, uh, Alibert Materio Ancien. In, in Provence, uh, you see the, the color of the sky. It's a different uh, atmosphere. Um, back to the north and the low countries uh, with Yves uh, Visser, Klinkers, and Kasserian, uh, another one specialized in uh, uh, roadwork uh, materials, reclaimed materials, uh, or here Burgundis, Creus, and V in, in Belgium, or here Entreprise Durand in, in France. Uh, another important output of this work package was uh, a statistical survey of the reclamation trade. Uh, we surveyed uh, about 300 businesses uh, on the different countries uh, and then applied uh, extra population coefficients to get a, the, the full picture. And it's quite interesting to see that uh, the total turnover that we estimated for, for the reclamation trade is uh, about 500 million euros, corresponding to almost 7,000 full-time equivalents, which is quite something. I mean, it's, it's a sector that is facing difficulties and uh, it represents quite a lot of jobs. So possibly something, inter in, uh, something interesting for public authorities 
utilities and public policies. We also try to estimate the stock of the reclaimed materials. It's not that easy a task, but uh, we found a, a, a proxy to, to do that, and we estimate it to be uh, 600,000 tons. Uh, so that's what's currently in stock, uh, stock held by these dealers. Uh, it's on one hand, it may sound a lot. It's not that much, to be honest. It's equivalent to the amount of demolition waste that is produced annually in the Brussels capital region. Um, but what is interesting is to see that even with a relatively small amount of materials, uh, the benefits in terms of employment, for instance, are quite uh, high, uh, way higher than for the, the recycling industry, for instance. Another interesting finding of this survey is that almost all these companies are either micro or small. There is almost no large companies bigger than, I think, it's 20 employees. So it's really a, a, a network of, of small and medium enterprises. Uh, and then another important deliverable of this work package is the setup of the truly reclaimed label, uh, which aims to attest the genuinely reclaimed origin of the materials as opposition to uh, fakely uh, aged materials, new materials uh, made lookalikes uh, and, and, and having a, an old and ancient look. Um, and so this is something operated by Salvo and that has been already adopted by some dealers. Uh, and then the second work package was about fostering the reclamation of reusable elements. And it mostly focused on developing an, uh, a method for uh, conducting reclamation audit or reclamation survey. So uh, trying to identify all the materials with the potential for reuse uh, prior to the start of the demolition works. Uh, so that that's one of the results, the method in, in itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a handbook explaining how, why, and, 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 and when you, you could and you should do that in, in your building. Uh, it's complemented with um, templates and annexes uh, on, uh, to, to facilitate the implementation of this process in, in any, basically any project going on. And there was also a prospective report led by the BBRI, uh, which uh, studied the potential offered by digital tools, uh, for instance, uh, scanners and, and different techniques to capture the, the, um, the existing or uh, characterize the existing building stock and, 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 and help uh, conducting better reclamation audit based on, on that. It's pretty similar to the presentation we saw in the, in the previous uh, session in which this kind of tools could indeed help to um, uh, make more thorough and more forensic uh, surveys and, and, and audits of the buildings. And then the third uh, main work package was about fostering the integration of reclaimed product in building projects. So basically the reuse part of the, of the chain. Uh, and for that, we developed uh, another handbook uh, explaining different procurement strategies that can be used uh, in different contexts, and especially in the context of public tenders, which come with a series of um, specificities that you have to take into account that are not always compatible with the realities of reuse. Uh, but we tried there to explain uh, a few pathways to, to make it possible uh, anyway. So it's mostly uh, addressed to public contracting authorities, but by extension, it also concerns architects and, and, and designers. And then we also produced 36 material sheets, which are very uh, complete and, and, and well-documented uh, documentary sheets um, explaining the hose and the whys of, of, of a few common uh, reclaimed materials. And so each sheet addresses the different aspect uh, of the, the description of the product, but also so how to reclaim it, how to reuse it, what are the known characteristics, things that you don't have to test anymore, uh, what is this? its availability on the market, a few indicative prices, a lot of information that should help specifiers uh, in integrating these materials into their workflow and, and, and their processes. Uh, and then that, that's a, a big output that was a bit in between the second and the third work packages. It's 
uh, it is the pilot operations. And so these are really live tests, live projects that the FCRBE project partners um, accompanied. Uh, the idea was to first get feedback on the newly developed tools and what better way than uh, applying them in, in real life situation to get a, an accurate feedback. Uh, the second goal was to introduce actors from the construction industry uh, to reclamation and reuse aspects. Um, and then there was a quantitative objective in, in reclaiming uh, 360 tons of building materials. In the end, we uh, outreached these results. I will focus briefly on one pilot operation that is possibly interesting for our discussions of today because it concerned mainly uh, a huge quantity of, of, of stone in um, social housing development from the 1960s in the region of Tours uh, in France. And this was a pilot operation that was led by Bellastock so I'm not completely um, aware of all the specificities, but I have a relatively good overview that I can try to share with you now. Um, so as I said, it's, it's, it's quite a, a lot of um, cut stones that were used there. Uh, this morning, we, <laughs> we discussed about the need to be more precise when we speak about stone. In this case, uh, to be honest, it's still a little bit of a mystery. It could be either a Pierre de Richemont, which is, which is an Ulithic limestone from the Turonian um, uh, strata, I don't know how to say that in English, or it could be a Pierre de Tufo, which is a chalky limestone from the Turonian um, strata as well. Uh, there are tests that have been conducted in lab and the things to do now is to compare the results with uh, the characteristics of those two different stones to decide uh, which which one it is in any case it's a, it's it's a, it's a quite a soft limestone typical from that region uh, that proved relatively easy to dismantle these are the tests uh, the dismantling test to um just to make sure that it was possible to do that without too much uh, lost uh, in this case, the pilot operation was also about finding uh, other ongoing projects likely to reuse those stones because not uh, the whole batch could not be reused on site. Uh, part of it could, but uh, there was also a, a work of a sort of sourcing work to find uh, other opportunities. Uh, you see there the map of, of the possible uh, projects. Obviously, there was also a lot of... Um, efforts involved to raise the awareness of the different stakeholders of these different projects and trying to find sort of a symbiotic way of, of working so that uh, the stones salvaged from that building could be reused by, by other ongoing projects. And that in entails, among other efforts, a lot of um, communication aspects. There were also, as I mentioned, uh, tests in the labs just to make sure that the characteristics of the stone were uh, known and were enough to meet this, the expectation of the new uses that are uh, intended. Uh, so basically testing the fitness for reuse of, of, of this huge batch of stone, uh, limestone. This is uh, a picture that Hugo from Bellastock just sent me uh, this morning. Uh, it, it's, it's a very recent picture of the dismantling uh, process. You see there uh, the, the, the big picture, quite an impressive. Um, what, what strikes me the most, if, I don't, if you were there this morning, you probably saw this picture from, the, uh, from Fernand Pouillon's working site in Meudon La Forêt. And it's, it's pretty similar, except that in this case, it's this unbuilding. Uh, but it's it's the same kind of tools. It's the same kind of, of size for the blocks. It's possibly the same kind of stone. So quite quite interesting. So that's the main results of the FCIB project. I, I should also mention a few other deliverables that may be of interest. First, um, we invested some efforts in developing a roadmap to foster reuse in public policies. So. This is a deliverable addressed to uh, public authorities at local or regional level. And it's really a collection of about 40 IDs of um, measures that can be taken to foster reclamation and reuse. One of these IDs, it's the one I like a lot, 
it's uh, it's the idea of having lists of protected materials. So materials for which we know reclamation is possible. We know there is a market for uh, this second-hand material. And so by default, this, this type of material should not be um, discarded as waste and should be salvaged with the purpose of reusing them. Uh, obviously, these lists may vary from one region to another, depending on the state of the market and the state of the habits. Uh, but but it, it, it could be a, a good way to avoid um, and to easily avoid a, a, a lot of, uh, of, of wastage. Another interesting deliverable is a, a report on the scope of reuse in the current green building frameworks. So certification uh, processes, but also a reference document trying to foster sustainable uh, approaches in the construction, such as BRIAM, LEED, HQE uh, in France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, interestingly, most of these are evolving and are uh, yeah giving more emphasis um, on reuse in their new version. So it's, it's, it's probably heading in the right direction. Uh, another one uh, regarding the, the, the scope of reuse in environmental impact assessment tools um, to branch on the discussions of the previous session also about the, the, the use of LCA to uh, attest the, the benefits and, and, and to try to, to get a, a good approximation of the benefits of uh, reusing materials instead of producing new ones. Uh, and then quite a lot of material for communication and, and, and raising awareness. Uh, this is a collection of seven booklets. Uh, I see the titles here in French, but they are all available in, in, in Dutch and in English as well, uh, covering dif different aspects. One of them is, is maybe particularly interesting. Is, um, it is addressing uh, the juridical status of um, reclaimed elements uh, in the context of the waste regulation uh, currently in, in, in force and, and it shows that by default uh, and especially when you express the intention of reusing this material, uh, they remain product and then do not become waste, uh, which is interesting to know probably. So yeah, I, uh, uh, this is a very short uh, presentation. I could go on for hours and hours, uh, but maybe the best idea is to, to have a look on the website, which is um, mentioned at the bottom of the poster there um, and you will find all the deliverables and, 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 and even more than what I presented. So I hope that I could offer you uh, a good overview. Great, thank you, Michael. Let's uh, jump straight to LA and then uh, some responses. Hello. Yeah, maybe uh, just a bit of context. I actually graduated from uh, James and Odeline's unit um, last summer. Um, so in many ways and many levels, it's very bizarre for me to be sitting on this side of the table. Um, and and uh, Adam has seen this presentation, an earlier version of this presentation. Uh, James and Odeline have already seen this presentation like 10 times and my ex flatmate who's also in this hall has seen this presentation like thousands of times and every version of it. So sorry, I have to sit through this again. Um, so, okay, I'll just get straight to it. Around the month of May last year, we were notified that these granite slabs from the postmodern behemoth at one broad gate were stranded on the demolition site and that there were difficulties in the search for a new home. The project sought to prepare for future scenarios like these and proposals that we should recommend a systematic uplifting of salvage and reuse practices to the Greater London Authority. The UK self-imposed deadline in achieving net zero in carbon emissions shifts ever closer, though there have been initiatives shown in achieving these targets. There have also been a number of shortfalls. One missed opportunity is this. Despite post-Brexit UK's newfound independence in establishing its own carbon pricing system, the UK has chosen to exclude incineration plants in the scheme. These once celebrated energy from waste infrastructures render waste disposal convenient and are often misused, simply sending resources up in smoke. The planned expansion to quote a resident who lives close to one in Edmonton is fundamentally unjust. 
Such disparity between action and ambition can also be seen in the realm of construction and demolition waste in London. The GLA's incoming requirement for projects to submit alongside planning applications, a, a circular economy statement is timely, but the numbers mandated draw no delineation between recycling and reuse, rendering the latter entirely optional. The Royal London Hospital's redevelopment clearly illustrates the difficulties that reuse and salvage practices face in dense urban contexts today. In between pre-demolition audits and heavy demolition works, there is a short window of opportunity during which components are dismantled and stored on site as they wait to be assessed and collected by potential purchasers. Due to a lack of space on site, an estimated 1,500 tons of stone, many of them Portland stone, was sent to be recycled and crushed into bits. So even materials that draw interest from salvage dealers often don't make the cut. The temporality of enabling work simply necessitates a quick evacuation of existing buildings on site. It's a shame that a decade and a half later, little has changed in practice and that the same fate awaits the granite slabs at one broad gate. The incoming plans do little to steer away from the status quo that we simply shouldn't be satisfied with anymore. So in November last year, last, last year, the London plan team organized for a presentation of the circular economy statement, as well as um, a kind of series of consultations during which we got to ask if there were any plans to introduce infrastructures for demolition contractors to privilege reuse over recycling, or if existing reclamation yards would be supported at all. The short answers, the short answer kind of made known um, the, the short answer to these concerns made known to the London plan team, not only by us, but by many other practitioners in the industry is no, or at least not yet. And though there have been grants offered to more bottom-up initiatives in the circular sector, we should not be afraid to kind of introduce strategies that meet in between. With recycling facilities so pervasive in the urban fabric when compared to salvage yards, it's difficult to privilege salvage and reuse practices even if demolition contractors and building owners want to in principle. And it's precisely this increase in the expedience of recycling that has caused reuse to become sidelined. And it's also difficult for reclamation yards in London to make sure that every square meter turns a profit. This became especially apparent when we chanced upon Leon, who is clearing out the outdoor yard in Aladdin's Cave, a reclamation yard in Lewisham, to make space to be rented out to Brixton Jam, a food and beverage company. The old Slade Yard has been operating under a railway arch and Premier reclaimed bricks tucked as an infill between residential blocks. Yards operating further outside from the city, however, are of course not as restricted and out in the fields they've accumulated as much space as possible over the many years that they've been operating. This is an interlude in between the lives of salvage materials, the duration of which is often unpredictable, and to sit and to wait is simply something that is inherent in the reuse process. A short, a short documentary with Jane from Re Clear Away Reclamation was produced, celebrating two sentiments shared by almost every yard that we've visited in the last two years. The first, that they see their work in mitigating materials away from landfill as also as a preservation of a heritage. And the second, that a large and to some the vast part of the job is sharing their knowledge and expertise on the very materials that they handle. And there are many other hamlets dedicated to salvage and reuse practices strewn throughout the UK. Just as there are construction consolidation centers in the city that receive and consolidate just in time loads to be sent on to construction sites that would otherwise not have enough space, there will be deconstruction consolidation centers that will become logistical mediators between demolition sites in London and reclamation yards further afield. The project pushes for subsidiarity in the London plan and proposes for a new public arm to be set up by the GLA to establish and manage the DCC. London Unbuilding will also introduce a new type of civil worker, the Unbuilder, to offer services in unbuilding, material evacuation from site, as well as a consignment scheme for salvage materials. And just as there is an elaborate plan of work spanning different stages and different key players involved in the act of building, the current dem demolition process must be, must be remediated and a detailed plan of work must be considered for unbuilding. And it starts with an amendment in demolition notices and applications. Local councils must make sure to first consider salvage and pre-demolition audits are to be done with an unbuilder present such that potentially salvageable materials can be, in, can be inventorized as packaged and each load is anticipated according to the sequence in which the building is unbuilt and demand is sourced. 
and building works can either be outsourced to, to the public arms army of arm builders or done by the demolition contractors themselves and whole loads whose materials have already previously been kind of requested by reclamation yards are sent directly to them from site. More mixed loads, however, will often need to be dispersed and consolidated in the deconstruction consolidation center where London and buildings collaborators will sort and organize them together with other registered yards consolidating loads. By mapping out the main corridors where materials are flowing along, recycling sites and reclamation dealers where materials flow into, as well as builders merchants where materials are flowing out of, we start to reveal a network of key players in the movement of materials in and around London. It is among these nodes within the network of flows where London and building will set up its first DCC here on the currently vacant plot of land owned by the Greater London Authority in Black Horse Lane. I don't think this plot of land is vacant anymore. So the movement of heavy vehicles are compartmentalized away from existing residential blocks to the south of the site. The main building is where materials are stored, processed, catalogued, and consolidated. It is also where sales outlets, exhibition halls, archives, libraries, lecture halls, classrooms, as well as workspaces and mass halls sit atop and alongside purely logistical corridors. A running program organized by the team is where the region's salvage dealers' expertise and knowledge become celebrated as a form of cultural output. The DCC is to be a new kind of, culture, uh, kind of center for learning in the city, open to the public to engage with and to learn about the processes involved in salvage and reuse. And it's a center of operations as well as a training facility for the unbuilders. So in the final agreements, the total resale value of all sold or soon to be sold materials is estimated with which a contract confirming an exchange of ownership of materials will be signed, establishing a consigner consignee relationship between London and building and the building owner. When these materials are sold, a cut of the profit is given to the building owner as a salvage bonus, a kind of reward serving as an additional incentive for, for a temporary halt in heavy demolition works. The percentage of this cut or the consignment rate depends on the services that have been provided by unbuilders. And this same interface is also a shared centralized online inventory on which reclamation yards in the region are invited to upload their stock. And the reseller's backlog is where requests for specific materials are, lock, are logged from which unbuilders all the way in stage one will refer to when demand is being sourced. At least in its, in, in its initial stages, this is an ambition that must be realized through gov government funding. Perhaps landfill taxes can be increased with London and building diverting more materials away from the landfill and perhaps waste incinerators can be included in the carbon emissions trading scheme. And after the first one has been set up, there can be room for more. And they must be accompanied with larger long-term stock holding yards, which hold on to overflows that don't see immediate demand. Consolidation is in managing a careful and precise dispersion of salvaged materials through into meanwhile sites where they do stand a chance. The project plugs into and upholds an already existing system. It is to be a viable model meant to be expanded upon and adopted elsewhere. It is a complex operation in coordinating many different processes and will almost never go as smoothly as I just try to make it sound. <laughs> so this, complex, this complexity stresses even more the importance in the expertise that our builders will have to be equipped with. In the face of a Green New Deal, the proposal can potentially introduce jobs that are sustainable in that there will always be buildings to be built and to be unbuilt, and materials, materials like the granite slabs from one broad gate to be kept in the loop. Because climate change is a collective and public crisis, curbing both carbon emissions and incessant extraction of materials should be done through collective public efforts alongside individual choices. And architects too, as material specifiers, have the responsibility to not only curb our understanding of materials only as end products, but to also remediate unsustainable processes we involve ourselves in. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ali. Let's jump straight to uh, Gaetan Daniels, also online. Would be very interested to hear the uh, Brussels perspective on um, yeah, municipal means of facilitating reuse and perhaps reflecting on uh, uh, a more idealistic vision like LA has just unveiled. On the one hand, idealistic, but on the other hand, obvious, kind of no-brainer. 
Um, hi there. Um, yeah, well, I didn't really prepare any presentation uh, as I uh, as I was more uh, expecting uh, um, a panel, but um, what I'm definitely going to do is uh, talk about our, our strategy. So basically, Brussels has been working around um, sustainable economy and more specific around a recovery of uh, of waste construction construction waste. Sorry for uh, for several years now. So um, the, the first thing we implemented is our, uh, our strategy around circular economy uh, that is called uh, Circular to Brussels. Um, and it has been actually in place since, if I'm not mistaken, 2016. So the, the previous government uh, introduced uh, Circular uh, Brussels, it, but there was already a um, um, some work around circularity, but it was for the first time actually that um, um, several ministers and administrations decided to work together around circularity, and also that there was a, a budget allocated for this this kind of uh, of projects. Um, and thanks to Circular to Brussels, there was also um, a call, an annual call that has been launched with a budget of around. Uh, two million euros, uh, and and the, the goal of this of this uh, call was actually to to um, finance uh, small R and D projects with a maximum of two of two hundred thousand euros um, to support projects around circular economy, and also well within the circular projects we also had um, projects in the construction sector. Um, Starting from, I think last year they removed the construction theme from circular from um, from this this call, and they they started a new a new one that is called Renolab, where they they actually promote um, renovation with, I mean, and and, and uh, circularity without within the, the the renovation sector. But we definitely want to continue to to focus on that uh, on that specific. Um, sector. Um, another thing that has been put in place um, since, uh, well, also, I mean, partly with the last government, but enhanced within this government, is our 2030 strategy, where we definitely set, I mean, they, all ministers committed actually to go for an economical transition. So my Secretary of State is in charge of this economical transition. Um, and so the, the strategy is called Go for Brussels. That's our strategy towards 2030. And within this strategy, we, we actually said that uh, by 2030, we want to shift all our um, economical support to uh, companies actually to, um, I mean, towards uh, companies that are active within the transition, which means that we are gradually actually um, stopping uh, the, the support of unsustainable companies. And by 2030, only sustainable companies will actually get support from the, from the Brussels government. Uh, and actually to, to, to decline this practically, we, uh, we came up with our regional strategy around economical transition. It's, uh, it's gonna come out quite soon. It's, uh, it's still, uh, um, I mean, my colleagues are working on, on, on the last um, on the last details, but basically uh, it means that all our strategies, I mean, all our plans, like for example, the industrial plan, the innovation plan, um, the economical support plans, uh, are also all going to shift towards um, transition economy. Uh, and uh, for example. What I've been working on for the last months is uh, um, I have been reviewing our industrial strategy. And from there also, we actually want to support um, specifically companies like, like Rotor. Uh, so Rotor has been, uh, uh, well, it has been in, in, in Brussels and in, in the Brussels um, ecosystem for many years now. And our, our view is actually that uh, we cannot do this alone. I mean, the government cannot do this alone. We have to do this together with, with the companies. And so that's why we are very, very happy that companies like Rotor exist, actually, um, and that they, they can help us uh, achieve our, our transition goals. Uh, 
specific, if I can give some specific examples, for example, um, Innoviris, our, our innovation uh, body, uh, financed a few years ago um, BCCC, so it's the Brussels Consolidation Sector as a Center for, for Construction Materials. Uh, and the idea was actually, was double. It was one, to work around sustainable logistics for the delivery of construction materials, but also to put in place the whole um, actually reverse logistics uh, for the for the construction um, materials that, ha that haven't been used or for construction waste. Fortunately, that second part didn't really wasn't uh, as successful as the as the as the 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 idea to go for sustainable logistics, but. I mean, they, they really started uh, the, um, the reflection with big construction companies. And that, that's actually uh, also something that we see um, is that uh, it is very, very interesting to have some, some, uh, some research. But if you don't have, I mean, if that research is not applied and if you don't go for a, a living lab approach, um, most of the time, actually, the results of your research uh, are very difficult to implement. So, um, I mean, living lab approach is something we, we really focus on and we still, I mean, we will focus on for the coming years. Um, another example is uh, lately we launched, the, um, I mean, a call for the uh, uh, waste recovery. I mean, urban waste recovery from which three big projects were selected. Uh, I mean, one is less into uh, uh, construction materials because it's it's uh, it, it deals with uh, with coffee waste, but I mean it's still interesting. It's perma fungi, but the two others are, are quite interesting. Uh, one is is focusing on plastics, and the other one is focusing on uh, on on wood waste. Um, and so the idea is to actually, together with these companies, and again, in, in, uh, in a more practical way, um, to see how we can actually put up a, a business model, a viable business model around these specific uh, waste strains. Because we also see that having a, a global approach is very interesting, but at a certain moment to make sure that, um, I mean, that you can reach a viable model, you have to focus on certain strains. Uh, and this is why, for example, uh, yes, wood, bricks, uh, uh, concrete. I mean, we still don't have really concrete um, recycling in Brussels, but we see that in, I mean, we see, we have two, two concrete centrals in Brussels, and it would be actually very interesting to see if we can uh, get the concrete from, from the many construction sites we have in Brussels, uh, and then try to have a, a recycling process together with these uh, with these two concrete um, um, companies. Um, yeah, that's more or less um, what we are doing in Brussels. And of course, I I, I, I mean I, re I I repeat myself, but we can do this alone. So the idea is actually to define a framework um, to set uh, goals and objectives, and then to work together with companies and also obviously with, with universities and research centers. I mean, for us, it's uh, we, we really push also for collaborations uh, with universities and research centers because they also have a uh, um, very useful um, uh, knowledge to, to transfer. Maybe last thing, it's also, and that we see also as a very big leverage is the, um, is the public command actually, um, because Okay, you, you have the you have the private sector, but the public sector uh, is actually responsible for more or less twenty percent of of the general demand. Um, and so, if we want to if we want to push actually for a, a more sustainable conception, we will also have to to enhance the the, the public demand. Uh, and so, we are working. Uh, within this um, economical transition strategy, we are specifically working also around uh, uh, what we call the, the circular and innovative public demand. And uh, the idea is to actually, I mean, Flanders has quite a, a big, um, uh, I mean, did quite, quite an, I mean, amazing job around that. But so 
the idea is actually to to go and see specific um, administrations or public bodies and to tell them, look, I mean, uh, if you want to buy something, buy something sustainable and, and in, a, in an innovative way. And this will definitely also enhance the um, the reuse of, of uh, construction materials because nowadays, I mean, public bodies are just going for the cheapest option and not for the most, most sustainable option. So through this uh, public demand mechanism, we hope that we also will be able to um, motivate these public bodies actually to, to reuse more construction materials. Great, thank you, Gaetan. You mentioned You're the, very welcome. the uh, Brussels Consolidation Center, which uh, was gonna act as a, a hybrid more traditional construction consolidation center, but sounds like it might also have integrated elements of the uh, vision that LA presented. I don't know how much of that you saw, but would you be able to comment on the kind of the accuracy of Ellie's vision and um, what was planned for Brussels and perhaps why it didn't work, why it wasn't able to be implemented? Um. Well, I, I think that um, the biggest problem was actually uh, time and money. I mean, as always, um, basically it was a, a four-year four-year research project. Um, they they invested quite a lot of money. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, the whole the the, the general budget was around one point four million euros, which is quite consequent. But basically, they yeah they um, they lost quite a lot of time to just to put in place the the collaboration structure, um, and yeah, at a certain moment they had to make uh, they had to make some uh, some choices actually. Uh, but the idea now is to see how we can build up um, I mean the next steps and continue. Based on this, on this, uh, on on the actual collaboration, uh, the um, the company that actually was I mean was participating definitely wants to wants to move forward and to see how they can enhance this uh, this reverse logistics. Um, a very interesting approach was also, and I see that was occasionally as well. Is I mean water transport. That's for sure. I mean um, we have a chance in Brussels to have a canal. Um, yeah, construction materials, best way to transport them is actually uh, um, over the water because uh, you can transport, I mean, big amounts and, and, and heavy loads um, quite easily. Uh, for example, the um, uh, concrete is the same. I mean, we would love to see a system in place where basically the now what we have is actually big trucks coming into the city with all this, this concrete, uh, sometimes coming from far outside of the city. I mean, we have these two, we do have these two concrete companies, but still, I mean, uh, it generates quite a lot of traffic uh, and it would be actually very nice um, to, to find a system, um, well, to find an alternative for this because it's actually, it, it generates a lot of, uh, of noise, I mean, um, and, and air pollution, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. That uh, definitely vindicates um, one of our students' projects from last year who was looking at water transport. Sarana, I hope you're listening. Uh, Gaetan, I have a, one, uh, one more question for you. Um, you mentioned uh, the economic transition and how you're focusing on um, facilitating that by 2030 through various economic shifts and presumably subsidies. Can you talk about real estate pressures? Because uh, circular startups often cannot survive the transition from a subsidized rent to a normalized rent. And Rotor, who you've supported already, is one of those companies facing that pressure now as they have to leave their current premises. So how much leverage does your department have in uh, other questions of rent? Yeah, it's a very interesting question eh? because we have been... Yeah, I was checking if the if my mic was on. It's a very interesting question because indeed a lot of uh, of these projects. Um, I mean, definitely what we want to try to do is to um, temper what we call temporary um, use of land, so abandoned buildings or abandoned land where we can put in place like these startups, these innovative startups. It's in general a very very nice idea. 
the um, I mean, the dangerous aspect of it is that, and it's the case for rotor, is that when you have to move out, you're facing actually the prices of the of the private market, and these prices are very high I mean, in Brussels because there is a, there is a very big pressure indeed um, of the of the housing market. So basically, there is big tension in Brussels. Brunsk, Brussels is is uh, stuck. I mean, it, it's a very specific case. Uh, we are we are a, a, a city region, so we are stuck in our in our regionals. Uh, I mean, within our regional border, so we cannot just expand. I mean, it's impossible. Which means that there is a very, very big tension between the different usages of the city, and especially between um, between the, the 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 housing sector and the industrial sector. So I'm in charge of, of support for, for uh, uh, industry and production in Brussels. My main uh, my main problem is to maintain to make sure we will still have um, um, basically enough space to have industrial and, and productive activities in Brussels. Also, because most of the time these these activities generate certain uh, I mean nuisances like I mean uh, uh, noise and, and, and dust and stuff like that. So. You, I mean that's that's the biggest problem. Uh, concretely, what we are trying to do basically is uh, it's 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 double. Um, we try, as I said, to make sure that we preserve as much as this of of this uh, spaces dedicated for the for for industry, and what we are also trying to do, and that's through uh, city dev. So city dev is the is the regional um, regional. Uh, instruments uh, to to support companies to to find a, a, a space to look. I mean, to to find yeah, a location in Brussels, either a building, either uh, either a, a, a terrain, uh, or the, the port of Brussels also supports these companies. Uh, and and the idea is through specific criteria to lower actually basically the um, the rents. So we're working on on specific incentives for sustainable and circular companies. And we would, I mean, it's still under definition, but basically what we try to do is to say, okay, you're a, a circular company, um, you, you're innovative, you're, you're uh, supporting the local economy. Well, let's make sure that your rent is lower than, than the rent of any other company because you're basically supporting the, 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 the regional economy. Um, we also do this, I mean, through uh, calls, for example. I mean, the port is doing this city dev a bit less, but the, the, the last call they launched and, and Rotor participated actually in the call was to, to be able to access one of the terrains, strategic, strategically located terrains of the port in at Turin Taxis. It's, in, uh, it's close to the city center along the canal. And basically the criteria we defined there were quite clear. We said, okay, what kind of companies do we want on this on this strategically uh, located terrains, we want to have only companies that are circular and sustainable. And uh, well, um, I'm not sure the results already came out, but they're going to come out soon. And, and I mean, let's hope that uh, that um, Rocha will be able to um, to go to that to that specific spot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think you mentioned, or somewhere it was mentioned that. This uh, meanwhile use was coming to an end. It's, it's interesting because the study of material flows reveals uh, for us that the meanwhile should often be established as permanent. And what parades as permanent is, in fact, tragically meanwhile. Right. So it's uh, they're really problematic phrases. Like meanwhile, it sounds very generous, but there's always a time limit. On yeah, the sure. But the thing. The thing is that these temporary uses are, I mean, are only possible because um, because there is a, a, a big project that is planned, but that is that, that won't be able to uh, to start directly. I mean, where where um, Rotary is actually it used to be a, a, a previous uh, chocolate factory, and they had, I mean, basically the project took quite a long time. Uh, to start because they had to to uh, to to get all the permissions. Uh, they had to check the, the soil pollution. They had to uh, find a promoter, a building promoter that wanted to to develop the project. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I totally agree. I mean, I, I would I would definitely be in favor uh, to make sure that we we have spaces 
where this temporary use can be a permanent use. But as I said, especially in Brussels, there is such a tension and such a pressure on the, um, on the um, available spots that it's very complicated for us to transform these temporary uses in, in, uh, in, um, yeah, in, in, in longer usages. Thank you. Um, I'd love to bring in Lionel in, in a moment if he has a comment on that. But um, Adam, I'd, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to invite you to talk about how Retruvius has navigated basically the, the price of land and, and how you've been able to operate given how uh, expensive it is. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, um... I, I just as, as a I, although it, it's it's very attractive to sort of like the idea of subsidising these green um, things. You know, I, I'm a you know a realist in that we operate in a capitalist way. We're purely commercial. We have no input from any public funds or anything like that. Um, we were lucky in that we when we started when I arrived back into London in 1997. We oh 1990 yeah um, I was able to buy a building for relatively small amount of money. Um, and without having done that, we, we then bought two other properties in the, in the neighborhood, all, all it, you know, for, for good sums. Um, so without having done that, I've no doubt that we wouldn't be in existence because, um, you know, the balance of rent, uh, you know, we, we're sort of slightly subsidizing ourselves by the increasing the property value and that, you know, we know that that's sort of going on. So it helps us to kind of balance our, I mean, we are, we are profitable, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it's very gratifying to know that there's sort of, the property is going to sort of pay for my retirement kind of thing, you know? Um, but, uh, I mean, I'd love the idea of, uh, turning Retruvius into a, into a cooperative like Rotor and maybe expanding it at some point in the future. In fact, we have just bought another property outside of London, but, um, I think in being brutally honest, I don't think uh, running reclamation companies in the centres of in the centre of London is viable. I don't think it's. I don't think the the use. I mean, you know, we're a very small company, and we we have had to really go towards fairly high value things for which you know there is an established market. I mean, sort of lighting and furniture, and and um, so you know we've had to move away from a lot of the architectural salvage that we would like to deal in sort of relatively low value things like doors and um, I don't know, you know, well, sort of other bits and pieces. Um, uh, I think it's sort of, it's kept, it's kept us very focused on, on being commercial. Uh, whereas I think if we had, you know, an acre of, or if, you know, 10 acres in, in the countryside with, with barns and whatever, you know, we would probably become a lot more sort of flabby, you know, just put stuff, you know, most salvage yards are, are, are pretty, um, uh, sprawling should we say um so um so yeah that that's, that's does that answer your question yeah, yeah yeah i mean you you were lucky enough to find a workaround basically or establish yeah. one yeah yeah early yeah. on and yeah. it feels like i don't think we would if i if i if i tried to start retrievious now um i couldn't afford to yeah 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 um yeah, that's what we find a lot of it boils down to land basically yeah yeah land value. and so many salvage companies uh, that I'm aware of have closed down in the last decade um, due to their sites being developed. Yeah. But if, um, you know, if the reuse industry at the moment relies heavily on subsidies, then we can say that sort of the mainstream, you know, capitalist world relies on externalities. You know, <laughs> every each department has its cheats, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's no sort of... Uh, yeah. default level playing field you know everyone has their yeah. advantages that they rely on yeah um i have a is it okay just for me to ask a couple more questions and then because i have a question for michael um or anyone else from rotor really and uh it's just an idea and it may be kind of verboten especially as through a palace you really try to honor the the informality and pre-existence of all these uh salvage yards dotted around the countryside and around Europe. But like, have you run economic models or do you think that it, it would be feasible or beneficial for like a uh, mega <laughs> uh, salvage company to be established that can really do this at scale? And at that point, would it become, you know, profitable in, in a way that rivals uh, a contractor dealing with brand new materials? Hmm. That's a very good question. The, the, the notion of the scale 
it's, it's indeed very, very interesting. And uh, obviously most of the, if not all the, the reclamation businesses we, we have visited, as I said, are pretty small. Um, but for me, it's still slightly unclear whether it is because in a sense, working with reclaimed materials uh, impedes you from uh, a mega growth, in, in, such as I don't know what what, what manufacturing and, and industry was able to do at some point. Um, I guess it comes with a cost. This sort of of a huge scale up probably needs to have some sort of standardized process uh, state stable materials, raw materials, something that, that, that you can control at, at, at that scale. And you may say that in a sense, batches of reclaimed materials are exactly the opposite of that. They are quite unpredictable. They are always different. Even within the same building, you may have elements that have aged slightly differently depending on how they were exposed to the weather and that sort of thing. So in, in a way, dealing with dealing in, in reclaimed material is, is a way to to deal with complexity and 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 you you may say that complexity prevents the, the major or the big big growth and that could explain why there is no huge players that that we know on on the market for the moment and you could say the same for the type of projects in which it is possible to reuse materials and at Roto we, we sometimes have this this sort of a categorization which is uh, completely uh, unscientific and, and and just a rule of thumb but it it, it, it seems to us that uh, between 30 square meters and and, and 3000 square meters this size of project this scale of project there are most of the time they are able to deal with uh, reclaimed materials and and, and they can um, trade with existing re reclamation dealer or salvage dealer uh, because the size of the batches is, is comparable the type of enterprises dialoguing together is is, is is a dialogue is possible above 3000 square meters it is another story and and we feel that above 30,000 square meter, this is even another story. And, and, and these mega projects possibly requires their own uh, reuse economy. And at that scale, it may be worth uh, investigating in situ reuse, same site reuse, this sort of strategy, because it, it becomes something else. And obviously the, the, the existing dealers are not always well equipped to deal with that sort of, uh, of scale. Uh, and I don't know if, if, if it's a pity or, or not, you, you, you could see it the other way around and say maybe the type of businesses that are operating in the reclamation industry are a good example of a resilient uh, type of, of, of businesses. Usually the governance behind this is, is, is interesting. The type of labor it produces is, is not too bad. It, it's, it can be varied. Uh, it's not monotonous. You don't have those production line where, where, where you spend 40 years doing the same gestures to, to produce the same time of, of, of goods. Uh, I, I, I know I'm caricaturing a little bit, but for us, there is something interesting in this model and, 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 and maybe to start from that instead of trying to, to, to scale it up, uh, to, to look at the qualities it has as it is now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Should we take some questions? Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks. No, actually, I wanted to follow up on that because I remember one one quote of you, Adam, when we visited right two of you, where you you tackled this question of scalability, and you were saying that reuse is not scalable at search, but it's humanly scalable uh, in the fact that the art of reusing of salvaging is a is a skill that can be transferred exactly the way Robert is also tra transferring uh, the, the skills and, and the craft related to, to stone. Um, and, I, and I think this image, you know, of, of the fact that the knowledge can be, can be transferred with the Opalis network. Uh, so the network of resellers that can become strengthened with possibly some commune tools, um, or some possible, some uh, commune operation or, some commune uh, platform that can that can support the network. Maybe this is this is the kind of mega project uh, that that could allow to to increase the, the percentage of material reuse. But it's it's really this this idea of uh, distributed and decentralized 
network um, that that can probably push the the practice to the next scale. Yeah, if I can branch on that, Odeline, just to yeah to to make sure that my message was was clear. Uh, of course, I'm in favor of of increasing the amount of materials being reused. Uh, that what that was that that is what the FCRB project was about. That is what Rotor is involved in. Uh, but I think we have to reflect upon the the strategy to do that. And I don't think that aiming at one or two big actors growing and and scaling up is the right way. I, I, I would rather see a sort of as you suggest, a sort of proliferation of, of, of small companies uh, spreading over the territories and, and forming a denser and denser network and, and possibly mutualizing some, some tools or some resources, if, even though it probably already happens in, in, in some informal ways. Uh, so that would be rather my, my vision for the future of, of, of this network if, if, if I had to, to, yeah, to, to work it up. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. I was actually just wondering, coming back to this question of scale, but also like small, like footed companies, but then actually the sense of like knowing what stock people have and how mm. that works. I was wondering, Robert, you mentioned um, earlier about this technology you're working on, which is like a sort of chip for, that would hold information about stone in terms of time and place and dimensions and so on. It might be this is completely proprietary, but I was just thinking with a BIM, you know, complete life cycle of a building, how, how that information is held. And if you think there might be potential or possibly Michael as well, whether there's potential for, even if there's lots of different players involved, for there to be an inventory that is more accessible or sort of shares a kind of, has a format in common that would also facilitate this. Because surely part of the issue might be that you'd have dozens of resellers that might have an odd square meter each and it's quite hard to figure out who's got what and where and it's lots of site visits and so on or do you think really that only becomes economically viable if it's contained within your own business practices from our experience there's um there's, there's the ability to put a microchip or a tag on anything and create an inventory um the problems we have is the um, the ability to store that ever-growing volume of material. And over the last 30 years, I was, I was thinking about it as uh, Michael was talking, our, our storage used to be two miles away from here. And then 20 years ago, it became five miles away from here. And we're now 30 miles away from central London, and that's where our storage is. And now we've got to take all our material from projects in London all the way down to Gravesend, um, we're not allowed to cut that Gravesend, so we've got to look at another way of doing that and bring it back. You know, it, it, we're creating more transport. As a, as a slight comfort to that, we're trying to, trying to use biofuels or HVOs or the right HVOs to reduce the emissions from our vehicles. But it doesn't get away from the fact that our storage has had to move further and further out of London. And the storage available to us has become less and less as um, certain warehouses are starting to um, take over the prime positions, which is close to the infrastructure where we need to be to get the big lorries in to deliver the, the material. So storage is, is a constant concern and we're constantly trying to find the next opportunity to exploit for five years, 10 years as a hard standing or as a warehouse that we can place um, the material in. The, the second concern for us is that there isn't really the market for reuse. There are certain opportunities at the moment through re-London to try and connect um, potential salvagers with potential users, but there's a disconnect there at the moment and there's no real appetite to use some of that material. We can we can put a chip in it, we can then relate that to the cloud and then on the cloud you can have all of the provenance and testing data for it. It can easily be captured in that sense and you can have it available on the internet, but without the storage and the market it, all we're going to be able to be doing is filling up a small space with a lot more material to the point where it becomes so clogged that you won't really know what you've got in there. I mean, you're, it just becomes like a storage wall. Um, this, this might be complete science fiction, but just for, for the sake of the thought, if when your stones get re-put back into the building, if they're all wearing their chip, so, so to speak, 
if the building then in 10, 20, 30 years time is then the client is thinking about reusing the building, is there, I know this is like at the realm of like science fiction, so, but you know, with their potential then rather than the, the, the point of availability, the window Audeline was talking about earlier happening at the point the client says, right, we've got, you know, vacant possession and we want to do something now and it has to happen now. Actually in the run up to that, all the information stored in this term that gets used quite a lot of the kind of urban quarry is actually legible. So maybe the issue of moving stone a huge distance and then moving it back becomes less, you know, less of a problem if actually that inventory is live at the point when, you know, you can put in a lead time for its availability, which might allow it to move from X, X to Y. Um, or is that just a total fantastical that, <laughs> scenario? That, that's putting a real technical spin on it. But at, at the moment, there is a requirement when when a client instructs an architect to do some work on the building, they have to give them the construction, sorry, the um, client's um, building plan. And they, all that information should already be in there as part of the first instruction to the architect to say, this is my building and this is the history of my building. And this is what you need to be considering when you're thinking about um, re-salvaging or reusing any of the material within it. There is a construction phase plan that gets developed by the main contractor, which should actually incorporate all of that information and look at what can be salvaged. So there's already, there's already a um, sort of a, a process in place that could be sort of bolstered and enhanced to, to sort of help promote salvaging. I think if I can come in, the, um, I think there is, you know, in the, in the 30 or so, near, nearly 30 years that I've been running Retrievious, um, the, the appetite in the last handful of years for so for, for what we do for you know uh, the awareness of sus sustainability which in all its amorphous um you know meaning um you know it's never been stronger i i you know although, although i'm a sort of uh cynic in one way i'm a sort of optimist in in, in in that i think this field will get more traction i think there will become you know a, a more a more of a market for it i've, I've seen it um, and i think with sort of you know young designers you accessing materials, I think as supply chain problems force up prices of new materials, I think the natural thing is to use existing materials. So I think I think you know I think there is a possible opt optimism. Um, so you know I think if the materials are made available, uh, I think you know they if they're cheap and available, uh, they, there will be a, a demand for them. You know there will be there will be people out looking at to use them. And I think what you see on the market today is there are quite a lot of, let's say, um, um, startups thinking yeah. about that. Like I think for Belgium and the Netherlands, it's it's the Madaster and it's really online where you can load up your BIM model with all your materials in it, how they're constructed, uh, what, I, what I was telling about earlier on. Yeah. And the idea is that you can make it public or private and that you know exactly, okay, if the build, that, that's theoretically everything, yeah? and we hope it will work in the future, but for the moment, it's data collecting, data collecting, data collecting to make it possible in the future that these buildings are easily or more easily dismantable than they are now, because as you said, we receive uh, what we call as built files of how the building was constructed 30 years ago, but these are like paper blocks. And before you, Eddie, before you can analyze it and how you can dismantle it, you you Eddie, you lost half a year. So if everything is digitalized, we hope that, that this will go way better. Yes, and actually, Valérie, you were saying that in the Madaster, um, when you calculate the carbon impact uh, of material, it also lies directly on the price of the stock market, which I think lies to what Adam was saying with the, the increased price of material procurement, um, you know, difficult of transportation. Um, it seems that there is a direct relation in the, in the tool you are using uh, that can impact uh, directly the life cycle uh, analysis and budget. Yes. Should we move to Q&A? Okay. Uh, so these were actually from the previous session uh, and we told them that we would ask them now, if that's all right. Um, so Brigitte actually wanted to comment on the wasteful habits of crushing stone, et cetera, for aggregate. Uh, she says, in my experience, this is sometimes recommended as a means of avoiding the use of new aggregate. 
and even promoted and it's even promoted as event environmentally friendly. The waste of good stone, et cetera, is not even considered by those people. Developers pride themselves on using recycled aggregate so much for a one dimensional view of sustainability. If anyone has a comment on that or we can move on. Yes. <laughs> There was a building in Finsbury Square about two years ago where they established that there were some structural issues with the external stone fins. And the client insisted that the stone, which couldn't really be used in any other form because it was too thin and too weathered, was actually crushed and used as part of the architectural fins that were then put in its place. That, Because they had to provide something which looked like what was there already, they were forced down the route to use a form of concrete, but they, were, they insisted that the concrete was made with the aggregate from the crushed fins that were there at the time. Just, it just came to my head, sorry. <laughs> that was a really good example, thank you. Well, I think Indina, is there a greenwashing amongst developers? Yes, sure. Sure, there is. I mean, I'm certainly not going to neglect that. Um, but I think in parallel and um, not defending the, the aggregates, when we speak certainly about aggregates for concrete and CO2 impact, I mean, the aggregates are a gimmick. I mean, what is negative to concrete is the cement that you make. Uh, the aggregates is maybe 2% of the CO2 impact. Nevertheless, for me, it's, it's and that's more about the, the concrete recycling that... Um, um, Gaetan from the Brussels region mentions, um, for the moment, the whole recycling about concrete is mainly about recycling to be reused as aggregates. And you might say, okay, you know, um, it's maybe marketing in a way, um, because the, the, the sustainable impact is, is quite limited yeah, of that, of that intervention. Nevertheless, I think these steps are necessary to analyze and understand better concrete and say, okay, now we got the aggregates, it's certified in Brussels in six months. Okay, it's a small step. What can we do further? And, and these little steps are also necessary in such a process to see what can happen with it. But that's, that's more concrete than uh, aggregate themselves. Does anyone in the hall has a question? Um, yeah, if anyone in the hall has a question. Yeah, I was I was wondering whether Ruth wanted to react on that because to, to the question actually we know that um, I, there is there is mining for aggregate. Huh? So so there is there is the demand for aggregate is, is much larger than than what the recycling industry can deliver. Um, so there is there is still quarrying and mining just for aggregate. So it's it's a good question worth asking. But but at the same time, you know, the, the loss that you have when you turn a stone into aggregate, you're, of course, I mean, uh, you, you have the embedded value or, or the craft or, or the, 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 you know, the energy that is invested in the initial cut that we discussed in the session, in the first session, you know, which comes with a certain level of uh, energy, but also ingenuity and, and art. And, and this is completely lost in, the, in this process of aggregate. So, I mean, it remains an open question, you know, we, we will still need aggregates and where should this aggregate be sourced from? From um, second use of directly uh, quarried, that's that's an open question, but what is sure is when you, you crush Ashlar's um, Pierre de Taille, you know, in French, that where, where you have a, a consequent labor and skill and craft and memory um, into aggregate that is definitely lost. Yeah. Um, and Sebastian has a question. Um, is it possible to reuse apparently less precious materials, i.e. structural concrete slabs as precast floors for or facade elements? Can they be polished for more attractive appearances? <laughs> so I'm thinking of um, Highbury Stadium. We removed the the east stand and repaired it and then put it back as part of the new residencies. Um, we're currently looking at the IBM building on the South Bank, which was one of last, I think it was Lasden's last building. And not too far from here down Kingsway at Space House, we've taken off the top floor. We're going to add a floor and put that floor back. And they're all precast um, units. So it is possible, but looking at other materials, the, one of the problems is providing a 60 year life for some of the components you're putting back into the building. And 
demolition contractors at the moment have been asked to demonstrate how they're going to reuse the, the steel frame of, of a building in the development of the new building on that space. And at the moment, their only answer is to use it as the temporary works because they know it's only going to be there for, say, two years. They can design a temporary work system using the existing steelwork they remove. Um, and that's the process that's going on at the moment. No one's really got a, the comfort and confidence to provide an existing piece of the building in the, in the next building with a 60 year plus life attached to the materials they use. Certain engineers at the moment, like Elliot Wood, are working with Grover Estate to look at some kind of um, passport for the existing materials on a building. But that means that they're going to have to start interrogating buildings at stage one to understand what the component parts are. And they're, they're going through that process. And other engineers are also doing a similar exercise. I can't remember their names at the moment, but I've, I've seen several, several good engineers who are offering the ability to interrogate a building to look at the structural components to see how they can be used in the next building. Valerie? Small addition to that, I think to, to what we do with Rotor and, and, and to be clear about the boundaries, for the moment when we speak about reuse, certainly with developers in Belgium, it's mainly the really biggest chunk is fit out. It's like floors and walls. And, but when it comes to structure, facades, everything related to water tightness, we've, I'm, all of my colleagues are very picky on certifications. And the problem is, if you want to put it, you have to do a lot of tests. And um, so, okay, you do the test, but the tests have to be compliant. And above that, about the guarantee about the testing, you also need your um, insurer, uh, insurance companies. I think you say it like that. That's very my English. Um, we always have like uh, insurances for for our buildings, for everything structural and everything facades. And you also see that in the sector of insuring buildings, they're not that far away. And when I put a product and then I have a certification, but it's not a certification of new, you also feel like I have to ask them, am I allowed to do so? And that's not always the case. So it's not all, always a question of of price because sometimes materials are not specifically more expensive, but it's also an idea of, of warranty, testing, and then the insurance company following. And all that system, you feel that over the last two, three years, also thanks to, to Brussels and the, the circular uh, groups, we're speaking about it and we're trying in the different segments to find solutions, but we're not there yet. I think we're in a market that is that disappeared through the years and tries to professionalize again. And of course, I think projects until 3,000 square meters will be easier um, on that scale to, to, to apply. And the bigger projects with the bigger warranties that are needed are coming up, but step by step as the, 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 the sector is professionalizing. Yeah, we can take more questions from the Zoom. Yeah, um, we have one more question actually, but I feel like we've discussed it, but I will uh, ask again. Um, so Simone asks, um, so they say, thanks for the great session. Um, can you speak more about warehousing and when it is an economically viable solution from your various perspectives, which I feel like we've covered. Um, but also how might such viability be widened, including more materials, longer times, also in relation to potential stakeholders, city councils, private companies, architects, et cetera. <laughs> on the warehousing cost, it costs about two pound per week per pallet to store it in a warehouse. And that, that's just a pallet. Now we stack them on stillages to try and overcome the challenge of space. But each of those stillages is a special stillage which costs a hundred pounds to buy. And um, we may have two thousand pallets there that we're trying to keep in, in the warehouse at any one time internally. So it, it, that comes to uh, so about £200,000 a year for, for just storing the material. And to rent the building is costing us about £200,000 a year plus a little bit more. So um, it's, about, it's a break-even exercise at the moment. And there's a constant need to try and find that space. So it, 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 it is a real struggle because we need something in close proximity to central London to make it um, sort of environmentally viable as well. So it's, it's a constant search. Can, can I just come in? Like if there was one uh, aspect of the London plan or, or one new 
law that the mayor of London could help facilitate for you, Rob, what would it be then? Would it be subsidised rent for your storage unit? Unfortunately, there, there aren't that many spaces within central London or within greater London to actually place a storage space of sort of three, four acres to, to place the pallets. So, and all the places that we used to use are now filled up with housing, which has got just as equal a, a need within London. So I think we're just the, not necessarily the poor relation, but the, the we're not the priority and we, we, we never will be. So we've just got to try and make it work. We're, we're down in Gravesend, and I, I remember that conversation earlier about using the river. And we, we do use the river to move materials up into London. Um, we know of several projects at the moment where they're using that as their primary method of um, delivery for the project. And they're lucky because they're right next to the river, so they can facilitate it more easily. But um, it, it's just going to be a constant, a constant challenge for us, I think, as uh, land in central London becomes less and less. Mm -hmm. The only thing, but it, it's more a discussion that I should have with our authorities. But I, I confess, and I'm not pretty, I'm not proud of it. But indeed, in the multi project, all the materials that we had to disassemble parts went to Rotor, and for other parts, we actually saw in the neighborhood, oh, can we rent something to put it? And it was so expensive that we actually decided to buy a boat through the, the port of Brussels, put it in a container, and it was stocked at the at the um, uh, contractor's site uh, near Antwerp, so like 50 kilometers away. Um, the only thing that we're looking at now, and I think that might be for our authorities, I don't know in London because it's, it's very Brussels-based, um, but we, we are having actually huge buildings with huge parking facilities, parking facilities that by legislation are limited more and more. So every time I get a permit, I have 100 places that disappear approximately. Uh, and we see there for us a potential also in, in the new project that we have, also with Rotor, um, to, to say, okay, um, we have to remove parking spots. We have about 1,000, 2,000 square meters underground that is fully free, can we use these spaces to actually have reuse within them? And then the next question would be, of course, on the level of the authorities owning also a lot of a lot of buildings in Brussels, in which way could we work like we work for the, um, uh, it's, again, it's typically Belgium, but it might be an example. Um, when you build a building, uh, you have an often imposition of what we call equipment. It's like when you, you say, I have 1,000, uh, uh, it's a bit too much, we have 200 apartments, uh, you have to foresee 1,000 square meters of equipment, which has to be filled in. M amenities? Yeah. Amenities? Amenities. No, no, equipment, no, no, equipment in Brussels is like uh, you have thousand. So let's say you have 200 um, uh, apartments, 1,000 square meters have to be foreseen for uh, a nursery, uh, all these, that's called equipment amenities. Um, and the question would be, I mean, it just, some, we, we discussed about it in uh, when, when we had some cocktails with colleagues, in which way could you do something like that for underground also? I don't know if underground is feasible, of course, for water, we're not from there, but we're looking at it from an owner perspective of for us to be incentivized to do on-site reuse in which way could we use another building of us in the neighborhood on the underground and use these spaces to stock but it, it's just for us but it's um yeah. no i was just gonna, sorry um I was just going to briefly say, I think there's usually planning um attachments in uk planning that's called a section 106 which is quite often amenity to do with social projects like art commissions, which I've worked on, but also other things that sometimes I think for the first. Community housing, charity housing. But also I think. Yeah, yeah, but I wonder if, that, if that's something that you've ever come across that might associate with this or whether that's something that could also potentially be within the London plan that could expanded the definition of a section 106. Um, or do you, maybe for uh, Robert and Adam. Usually um, section 106 yeah. is quite a small percentage of the entire building. Yeah, section 106 is usually um, a, a small percentage of the entire build and developers, I can't remember the top of my head what this is, but they, you know, this is a loss making yeah. patch of land for them. So they only build the required percentage and, you know, they, they're not generally 
kind of storage yeah. that Ellie needs in his ideal world. You know, that patch of land that Black Horse Road has been built on. Yeah, you know, and it, so I, I, but it would be really great if something like that could come out of this, you know, be this absolute commitment for developers that if you are going to develop this land, then you've got to pay into your storage in Gravesend. From a personal observation, the developer will always put the Section 106 work at the end of the job when they're actually starting to gain rental from the development they've just created. So it would, if it's a five-year development, then in the last year, they'll consider putting in the 106 work. It's yeah. just a personal observation. No, but I, I was just thinking of like a couple of projects I've worked on in, in Bristol, which had a, a really... A, a, an art consultant or who worked in the planning department. He was he was a planning officer who oversaw that and who was absolutely dogged about making sure that it didn't always come at the end because quite often then developers would walk away from their commitments. So actually that then comes back to it being to do with public officials enforcing a requirement which also then maintains a level playing field. The other thing about Section 106 is that it can be interpreted in a number of different ways according to the specifics of the site and the need locally so it seems like there might be potential to expand that a bit but also it would require very robust oversight by the planning department mm -hmm. um i'd like to ask a question of michael and, and bring la in as well um Michael, what kind of traction have you seen uh, happen as a result of your work with FCRBE? How close or what progress have you made towards your long-term goal of increasing reuse by 50%? What kind of impact do uh, all these documents you're making have? Who reads them? What uh, enforcement power do they have? Um, how does it feel to be working on this? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. At, I guess my answer would depend on at what moment you ask me that. At some point, I, I feel a little bit like a Jehovah Witness after a long day of, you know, ringing the bell of every house and speaking to them about uh, what they need to know and 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 how they could do that and how they could achieve that. Uh, to be honest, it, 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 it it's it's slightly frustrating at some point to see that. Um, yeah, obviously things move, but they don't move really fast, not as fast as we would uh, want them to move. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also quite impressive to see the um, how the um, how widespread the, the, those questions have become. And, and, and so it's a question of, yeah, is the glass half empty or, or half full uh, <laughs> between optimism and pessimism, a little bit like uh, Adam. Um, but yeah, for me, it, it, one particular example is that 10 years ago at Roto, when we started a discussion with almost anyone, uh, we had to make the distinction between recycling and reuse. And we say, no, it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, obviously, it's in fact very different. Uh, nowadays, it doesn't happen that much that we have to do that. And it seems like for many, many uh, contracting authorities from the public sector, but from the, the private sector as well, this has become a concern. And, and I totally agree with Valérie that there are still many barriers, and especially for big scale projects with a lot of requirements, uh, we are not there yet uh, don't know how we 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 know what needs to be to be done uh, i'm not sure how, if it will be done that's another question but yeah raising awareness that that's my feeling about this fcrbe project and and i'm quite happy with the um yeah the partnership and and somehow it gives us a, a um a platform which is more widespread than what we used to to have before this project and i guess also this is our first contact for hotel i mean with uh european authorities even though they are still a little bit far away and and, and slightly nebulous for the moment we, we we feel we've got that that sort of a, a connection starting to to grow which was not the case like three years ago so yeah these are the the maybe the for me the the the, the main impact yeah, I mean, it's it's inevitably a struggle, right? Because as you pointed out with the question of scalability, reuse cannot like mesh with the current economic system that we're in. And in fact, you know, let's admit that's part of why we're all interested in it, because it 
kind of throws a spanner in the works on the one hand, and it's like an X-ray that reveals how stuff actually works, you know, in uh, construction, design, real estate. Um, yeah, I think for us, it's a really fascinating lens to look at all this stuff through. Um, I just want to ask Ellie, like going back to kind of uh, traction and uh, practical steps, it feels like one thing, um, <laughs> I feel like you're tutor again, but one thing you could do is like, you know, your, your, revert, your revert protocol where you inserted a whole new uh, set of steps that should be part of the official system. That also feels like a no brainer and like not difficult for Reba to integrate, like printing another page in their manual, you know. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that? Um, it, it was part of your presentation today, right? Or am I remembering it from previous ones? Yeah, it was yeah. part of the presentation. Okay. Um, I think in retrospect, the kind of job of um, the proposal was really to kind of paint um, a kind of picture of how, um, how it might look like in that ideal world. And obviously when the picture is painted, you know, you, you can see it quite concretely, at least on paper or on screen, then it feels like, oh, that's a no-brainer, that feels easy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what's missing is all the steps that's going out in between, mm -hmm. um, which, you know. So is this, uh, uh, can you just recap that aspect of your proposal? So it was a rebirth proposed protocol for unbuilding, basically, right? Yeah, so um, currently in the rebuild stages of construction, um, demolition only exists within that kind of line that I drew in between two stages. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of, uh, I guess, the rhetoric is that, um, you know, that line should be expanded into something that's a bit more considered, into something that's almost as elaborate as, you know, the building process, which spans six, seven I'm not exactly sure how many yeah. numbers of stages, but... Yeah, yeah. Because within that hidden area, if you unfold it and open it up, lies a whole kind of material awareness and, you know, another way of approaching sustainability that's much more kind of uh, productive and revealing. Yeah, are there any more questions in the room? It looks yeah. like there are. So I have a question um, about... It's a really practical, sort of realistic question. So we've been discussing basically things that we would like to happen, but sort of depend not on us, but on other people. And as Robert said, there is no huge market for reuse yet. So there has to be some kind of incentives to boost it, to stimulate it for growth. Some of these incentives are environmental, time-based and financial, environmental probably should be enforced by the government. There's, I don't know if there's any other way to establish this one, but time-based and financial. Would you say there are things that depend on us as uh, people who are interested in reuse inside the reuse industry and even outside where you could maybe lobby something um, that we can implement to actually uh, make an impact on development of reuse? in the world. There is some influence happening at the moment and, and, and Veronique touched on it, which is this perception of clients and tenants to have a carbon neutral um, identity by whether it's 2030 or 2040. And the buildings that they um, work in will form part of that calculation. At the moment, you can claim your carbon neutral if you um, achieve scope one and scope two um, achievements, which is about the fuel you use in your vehicles and about the where you gain your electricity and refrigerants. And that's roughly it. If you, if you can zero off those three parts, you can claim your business is carbon neutral. Your actual building and your product um, will follow on in the scope three category. Um, and at the moment, we'll, you can claim to be carbon neutral by claiming scope one, scope two. It won't be long before they start to expect you to have a same level of credentials with your scope three emissions and carbon expenditure. So the buildings which are there already are the ones that will, people will want to work in or own or company owners will want to be renting because they will help them to get to that position. And 
all the other buildings are going to have to catch up. So it's it is happening, um, but it's very slow. But it, I think it is happening. I think we discussed it during lunch also. I think I, I fully agree upon that. So that's what we see for the moment. We had big tenants recently, and it's really about this CO2, we say CO2 equivalent for the LCA analysis. I don't know how, how it is in, in London. Um, in our project in the Netherlands, it's already imposed. There is not a grade, but it's imposed. What we see in Belgium, it's for example, when you have a BREEAM certification where indeed uh, the LCA becomes important, um, we see that both BREEAM and LCA in a kind of co competition, but mainly on the on the office market, more than on the residential market, there is a big competition in between developers to do better than the other. And that outplays the politics miles away for the moment. Uh, but indeed for me, it's, it's the politics to be hard, but also um, us as, as developers, I think it's really, really important for the moment, awareness, experience, and I think, um, amongst architects and engineers also to, when it comes to reuse, it's very nice to look at the things that worked. And I think today we saw a lot of things that, that worked, but also during lunch, we had a nice discussion. Um, there are so many things that failed. So many reuses that just, and, and Rotor, and we, we have a, sometimes a lot of hate relationships because sometimes I really have to stop things because we don't have the guarantees, we don't have the logistics, the price suddenly goes up the sky. Um, and I think learning about the mistakes that are done now is even more interesting to learn about what, what went well and, and that you can only do by having, having any tables like this and then discussing about those projects also. Thank you, uh, Veronica. It's, it's funny because, you know, what you're doing today, it's part of the answer. I think the work that um, this, the unit is doing into, and you yourself, like your 3D model, a facade um, made of Portland stone that will be demolished and you create data and you survey the material. So it's a form of revealing um, so I think in the recording, the recording of the fact that things are being demolished today, in in the recording um, and the sharing and the, and the picturing, um, it's it's really contributing to a sensibilization. Uh, like Michael was saying, has still quite some impact. Um, I mean, Amaya has been liaising and working with stakeholder and hopefully who knows uh, selling a batch of stone and literally salvage, salvaging it so i think yes you you've really been on the ground and actually operating and and i think if this is to be demultiplied you know with other schools um and other um stakeholders and um that that would possibly you know contribute to the to the very large efforts but um, maybe something interesting i wanted to point out um uh, we've we've been trying to populate uh, wikipedia which with demolition pages so basically creating demolition pages on on wikipedia um and 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 julia has has uh, tried a tentative uh, it's it's not actually very easy to get something published on on wikipedia it's it's a very tough tutor you know they that really before you you make it is quite difficult and and actually one one answer that Julia received is the, that demolition was not uh, an event important enough to be listed at the, as a separate page and so here is the debate uh, basically so I think contributing to this culture you know to try to elevate. Um, to change demolition from a minor local event to something that is really quite impact, impactful also culturally. Yeah, it's part of the exercise, I think. Thank you very much. I was going to sort of say something similar to that. It's, it's about um, social acceptability. I mean, we've seen over the years, though, you know, um, changes in, in social practice from recycling your bottles or newspapers or whatever. And then I think we need to get to a point where building owners are held to account and it's socially unacceptable to strip out a building that was um, fitted out a year ago or to demolish a building that was built 12 years ago. Um, you know, I, th I think there are, maybe there are some valid reasons why, you know, development and, you know, again, we operate in a capitalist world, of course, you know, um, people don't do things, you know, without reason, but, you know, to hold people to account and actually just 
you know, really interrogate why why this is happening and and you know, is it necessary? Does it have to happen now? Can we have a, another few years out there building, or can you know, does that uh, fashion refit need to happen? You know, I think we're seeing in you know the re 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 uh, the, sorry the growth of of uh, secondhand clothing. I mean, you know, the fashion leads a lot of things, and I think that philosophy will push through or is pushing through. I mean, definitely we've seen it. And I fully agree. I think the, the only thing that we see for the moment, um, and, and, and it's maybe a bit strange what I'm going to say, but indeed we speak about uh, refurbishing. Uh, you, we, we think there is one um, aesthetic refurbishment every 10 years. That's what we put in our models. Um, but in aesthetics, there is also one important point um, is throughout the 20, 20 last years, I don't know for London again, um, Brussels reference, um, the technical specification and then insulation values every five years tend to go up. And the issue for me, for example, I, I, we just acquired a portfolio of five buildings, a construction year between 90 and 2000. It's just impossible to rent out because my my air volume that I can pump in the rooms is too low. And with COVID in Belgium, it's it's 40 square meters of air per person mm. per hour. That's huge. Eh? That can be upgraded to 50 to 80 since the Corona pandemic. So you cannot work so hard that you see the the, the air flow by. So. There is a whole thing about, okay, you have that, that, that building that have been dimensioned to certain technical needs. And more and more we see these technical needs go up. And every time it's the first exercise that we do when we buy a building is, okay, what is the technical specifications, not the materials? And can I upgrade it to the needs of today? And sometimes I, I just cannot fit it in or I have ceiling heights of 220 and then I cannot. So it, it's sometimes more complex, but I just wanted to, to yeah, voila, yeah. clear that out also a little yeah. bit. So I'm not against opening windows, but in, <laughs> no, I, I mean, if we could, we, we would, uh, but we see that the demand and on the market is often, no, we want the, the yeah. HVAC to work independently. So there is also sometimes a mind shift on, um, yeah. on that. I, we, I, we tend to work within the residential market. You're obviously working in a commercial market. I think they're quite different animals, but I get your point, yeah. Um, I had uh, another question, and maybe it's towards Valerie, but also who, whoever wants to answer. But I'm just wondering now that, I mean, it seems like we have so many stakeholders driving so many decisions on reuse, but we are at the end of the day sitting at an architecture school. And I wanted to ask you, like realistically, what degree of agency do architects have in all of this? Like how much say do we actually have in the reuse of these materials? Like, I mean, one, I think we need to be more aware of what's going on in our practice and what we propose. It's not just something pretty, but it's, you know, it has a real impact and also what happens afterwards. But I guess, should we be more stubborn maybe in developers or should we be more informed on, you know, how to like technically solve some of the challenges and not just, again, like propose a pretty picture or how can we help? <laughs> no, but it, it's a very good question. And, and I think that maybe I'm wrong, but in my head, in a way, an architect, uh, together with the architects of, of, of Multi, also Konings, um, for us, it was the last six years were, were uh, trajectory of of um, discovering it together because we did not we had had not done it in the past they had not done it in the past we discovered a lot of we talked and and i think in the future um what would facilitate reuse is that the architect also becomes a facilitator uh, that when you design um, you come and you say you know this is reuse and we want this type of zone and we, we don't have a batch today but you know on secondary market we can find it like when you're writing your tender documents that indeed and, and that's an exercise we, we are going to start with Ali. we start already with with Rotor on a future project Centre Monet. it's really helping us also to um, make it like professional to really say, okay, maybe I don't know exactly which batch, but I know secondary market and you write it like that. And, and we're, we know that, okay, they understand what they're busy with. They understand that we need certifications and they understand that, voila, if, if every product, for example, uh, raised floors, uh, this is typically something that you can reuse. Uh, 
then a rot or a specialist function, uh, they know we need the specification, but then I don't have a problem putting it, but I just need to, to be. And I think the architect can really facilitate that. And by integrating, and I think that's that's important. And certainly in Brussels, we're trying to see that, that this is going on. It's in the professional market that I am, offices. Um, when when I have, I can show it later to you if you want, the latest pictures of the multi-tower, when you come in, it's like very business. Uh, it, it's a business look and feel. Sometimes people think about reuse. Oh, it's like with the, the wooden uh, pallet things and then the green hanging from the... No, but that's still an idea of, of reuse that there is. While with reuse, you can really be business-like and being able to uh, make renders that look fancy, even if it's reused, that's really, really important to have this mind shift also for developers. <laughs> Maybe I'm just being a bit of a cynic, but... Um... I, th I think architects have the, the intellect and the design skills to do whatever's needed. And I think it's the legislation that needs to force the developers to actually commit to it. And everything that I've worked on over the last 25 years is being driven, up until about the last five years, it's been driven predominantly by legislation. Um, there has been a mind shift with some informed developers, and there's some very good developers who've managed to find some very good architects to work with on some of the projects we show. But on the whole, it, without the the planning legislation to to impose upon them to actually undertake the idea of re, repurposing materials and ideally repurposing those materials on that building to stop um, things from just ending up in storage for infinitum, it's, it's not really going to gain traction. Uh, I, I, agree to, I, I agree to that, but then what is role of the architect, I think, that both are in parallel. Once you have to, I mean, you have to have a certain imposition. But the problem today, and that's also an exercise with water, is how, for God's sake, do you measure that? Uh, do you do it in kilograms? Do you do it in price? Do you do it in volumes? Uh, what is what is an elevator? Uh, on price, it might be a lot. On, on weight, it's maybe not. But maybe on CO2, it's more impactful than on kilograms. I think the authorities are not to a point where they can define it concretely. What I think is very important, and that's what they do in Brussels, is when you have a permit, they really check, okay, what are they demolishing? So on the level of the structure more and on the level of the facade. On the level of the finishings, they're not, it, it's very difficult to make it into, into policies. And I think there, the role of the architect or the interior architect is very important at this stage and certainly for the 10 years to come to really show that it's, you can do amazing things with it. That's, that's my feel. It's also a question of um, enforcing accountability. And on that note, am I like you to speak a bit about your projects and how you've found this sort of uh, accountability black hole and that you're kind of uh, retooling the role of the architect as uh, maybe a, a policeman, <laughs> an ombudsman. <laughs> so, yeah, can you talk about the... Yeah, what's happening at, at Fleet Street. And, yeah, uh, um, so Veronica and I have been looking at um, a demolition site that's currently underway in Fleet Street. Um, it's Salisbury Square, and it's going to be turned into the new Justice Quarters. Um, and when we were looking through um, the planning application portal, we found that there was a document that said that there was ambitions to reuse the Portland Stone on one of the buildings um, and we came across the client and they also expressed ambitions, but pending them finding a client for the stone. And it seemed like no one was looking for a client. So it was all kind of false promises. And it was, um, as I was speaking to some of the panel members, um, that it's, it's a bit of, greenwashing and it's just a way you know for for whoever's reading this in the planning document to be kind of happy like oh okay cool they're you know they're doing something like reuse oriented that's good mm -hmm. but no one's really held accountable and and i guess my role now is to actually find someone to take the stone and to um maybe air out some of this like greenwashing tendencies that we have in these documents because the city's saying one thing and then they're kind of allowing the complete opposite to happen. So that's 
I was just going to it would certainly make a good story in the press. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the absence of, uh, of body to, to control, controlling body, um, compared to the initial document that were published. Um, there's, there's a question at the back. No, it's not a question, but uh, we all know it's very much. It's, it's been for a long time. And it's um, the, 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 the problem is that um, it's all a question of it's all it's a, a question of will, you know, and who is driving the project and who is at the helm of the project. You know, if it's the the client, which is driven by sustainability, or the architect, and so on. But it's all a question of will, and most importantly, it's to have as well ahead of the in in this all this document, this pre document, having contractors, um, uh, demolition specialists, to see if it makes sense to make this work. Because it might not make sense at all to save this uh, Portland stone or any other stone, because nobody will want to store them. So I, I think sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, bullshitting. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't make sense, but it's, it's, um, it's accountability. Um, let's not forget that, you know, 20 years ago, a, a developer was called, was called a speculator. Okay, so uh, you know it's nice, it's a nice name now, developer, but it's all about money. So if straight away at the beginning of any 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 um, uh, any planning, you, you've got contractors who, who can tell you and put the money money on things, then maybe the, the developer will be happy to look at numbers. But if there's no numbers against it at the beginning, they're going to print a nice paper, and that's it; it's forgotten. So. Sorry, with the particular project that Maya's talking about, um, there were four large demolition contractors that priced the package of works. So one of them obviously found a, a, a gap in the floorboards to, to fall through. And that's, I suppose that's one of the frustrations. That it was down to the, the tenderer's um, opportunity to find a wriggly route through that the others didn't really see. So there, there, there is some... Um, scrutiny that's needed in that process because there is it's clearly evident that it's it's being promised and it hasn't been delivered because i i think i understand as well that it's it's not viable to save all of the portland stone or any material but i think the point that i found interesting was that it was mentioned in like in writing at all you know like we know that it's not viable most of the time but i think they put their foot in their mouth a bit by actually printing it um, and giving this false promise. And it's completely understandable that it's not viable, but then I don't think that they should say anything. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of what <laughs> I'm making them accountable of it. So yeah, but uh, thank you for your comments. Yeah, I, I mean, I've actually had, on that particular demolition site, I, I personally feel that the granite represents a, a bigger win um it's more usable there's more of it it's uh it's more straightforward and I, I think i mean i think we've got to keep your eye focused on what we're trying to achieve here you know why don't we want the this, this stone to be smashed we don't want it to be smashed because you know it's it's a you know you're if you're going to quarry new stone there's, you know it, we're talking about environmental wins here right so you know i think you just keep, keep your eye on on the big target and i for me on that particular job it's it's definitely the granite um I, I see no reason why that can't be saved. I think physically it's it's pretty easy. Um, and, you know, it's reuse potential is so much broader. Um, yeah. Nice, thank you. And it was uh, Pierre Bido that joined the conversation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, actually, just to go back to, to your initial question, Amaya, regarding the responsibility of the architect, I think we still have a fair um, amount of... Um, effort we need to do in that sense in uh, adapting our way of design. There is quite a seminal text by Lionel de Vliger that was uh, published in Criticat, L'Architectural Envers, Reverse Architecture, where of course he's describing the fact of deconstructing um, architecture, but at the same time, the mental stage in which you have to be when you work with reused material, which require a certain level of modesty and an elasticity of mind to start with the found object. Um, and this is not the way architecture has been practiced for decades. You know, you, you come with sometimes a less or more abstract idea 
and then you try to 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 procure this ID with with material um, that you would consume. And here is is really the, uh, also a, a sort of exercise of architecture reverse architecture where you start with a found object and then you kind of adapt your design to that. So I think there's still a lot of work to, to be done uh, in practice and in academia to, to change the state of mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a huge open door for architects today to think about what is the style of, of reuse? You know, what is, what is the aesthetic of reuse? Um, nobody's established that yet. <laughs> was obviously an, an aesthetic and an ideology was developed for mass production in the 20, early 20th century. It's called modernism, but we, you know, we don't, what's going to be the equivalent of that when um, reuse becomes kind of economically viable and more and more necessary ecologically and morally. So yeah, yeah, there's lots for you to do. <laughs> Sorry. So as a stonemason, I, I think as a stonemason, and I'm sure there will be other craftsmen saying the same thing, but wood, stone, any material that has been touched by the craftsman, craftsman is sacred. Okay. It, it's not a question of, of sustainability of anything. It's sacred. Work is sacred. Energy is sacred. So let's, that, that is the real value of things. Um, and, and I think I, I missed the beginning of the, of the talk and I'm sorry, but I'm sure it has been cited as well that energy is sacred. You know, all, all the things that is done, it's because we, our society is so wasteful for the last 40, 50 years that we, we don't look at the final bill um, you know, and, they are, and what's it costing the earth. And um, I, I think we tend to forget, I think we tend to forget, okay. I think we tend to forget that 60 years ago, uh, 70 years ago, people were recycling a lot more than we were doing now. You know, it, it's quite incredible the amount of things that they were recycling because it was expens expensive material from, from just nails to, to old boots to anything was recycled. So I think we, I think we just need to make it work again. And it's, it's a question, and, and again, it's, it's architect, engineer are looking into it, but a question of will. Um, and, and, and for people who, who've got the calculator for the cost, just to, you know, to, to, to make it work in favor of recycling. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, as you are saying, the granite, it needs to be saved. You know, it's, 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 it's earth. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be, you've got people working on it, getting it out of the ground, putting it on the bed. So putting it on a, on a, on a truck, then lay it on in central London. All that is sacred. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, we need to put back real philosophical value on work and not just throw everything. Uh, and yeah, so that's it. Oh, sorry, I'm a bit hungry. I'm a bit hungry. A no, bit no, hungry. thank you for bringing that dimension. <laughs> um, how are we doing for time? Should we try to wrap up? I mean, yeah, wow. What an amazing conversation we've had. And that, that's a great way to finish it. We talked about scaling up. We talked about uh, yeah, maybe how reuse cannot be scaled up, at least, you know, playing by the rules of capitalism. We've had sci-fi uh, scenarios where maybe like every piece of material in a city would have a RFID tag and uh, be in the, on the internet of things and in the blockchain. And then maybe then we could play by capitalism's rules, you know, and like there would be enough predictability in the supply chain and then we could scale up. And it, yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, we can still relish the informality of uh, reuse and how it's still small players, you know, in, in the regions, in the hinterland, and, uh, you know, who acts as kind of scavengers and use workarounds and the occasional government subsidy. Uh, there's a, you know, change of mentality is necessary from contractors, change of role from architects. Yeah, it's just such an incredibly rich field. So thank you so much, everyone, for contributing your yeah, amazing ideas and expertise. And uh, yeah, let's call it a day to be continued.
Um, if I may just very briefly say thank you very much to Ben once again for his really hard work to make all the multi layers of AV and audio work so seamlessly to have. <laughs> And also to manage in the public program for supporting this and the exhibition next door as well. And um, I, the last thing is to thank our contributors, but also to say, please do. It's, it's such a pleasure to have so many people in the room with us as well. Um, so I'm sorry to those of you online. I hope you'll go and have a Friday evening drink somewhere. But for those of you who are here, I hope you'll join us in the gallery next door um, for drinks to continue the conversation. And I'll pass over to Audeline. Yes, thank you to Odeline and uh, Juliet for your amazing organisation. This is a very important event. Thank you. Thank you.